Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Jake Tebow, as you probably know, and I am uh, making a video uh, series for my book that I just came out with. It's uh, Transgender Ideology and Gender Dysphoria, A Catholic Response. Uh, I've gotten some feedback that uh, the book can be uh, a bit dense, <laughs> maybe a little bit difficult to get through all the material because it's particularly long and somewhat complicated, uh, hopefully not because it's written terribly, <laughs> but it, it could be part of that as well. So I thought I would do a series where I'll go through the different sections and describe it. Uh, and it might lead uh, to some insights within the chapter when you're reading it. Uh, and if, you, if you're never going to read it, uh, these videos still might be helpful just to give some context because I think some a lot of people actually are very interested in this topic uh, here from social workers and teachers and people who are in the field uh, of working with, particularly with youth um, who are looking for some guidance because they can't really wrap their head around it. Right? It's a kind of a, a new concept and nobody wants to be uh, hateful. Nobody wants to be judgmental. Um, but at the same time, um, we don't let ourselves be guided by uh, ideology or by teenagers. <laughs> right? uh, when I was growing up, we believed what teenagers really uh, presented themselves as, as in forms of identity. Uh, we would have a lot of goths running around town, uh, followed by emos. You know, but youth eventually they often grow out of things. Uh, so it's important for adults to be kind of grounded in uh, good science, good philosophy, uh, good social sciences, in order to know how to best guide a, a young person and not get caught up in the ideology, right? How do you support someone? You know, how do we listen to them? How do we guide them? Uh, but also use some prudential wisdom, right? Uh, we don't, the, the wise thing isn't that we just follow children wherever they go. Uh, and then there's adults as well who are dealing with this, who, you know, how do we, how do we understand this situation? Um, I'm starting with chapter two because chapter one is the introduction. Uh, introductions are a lot like conclusions, <laughs> right? It's not filled with a lot of facts. It's kind of presenting the whole argument. Uh, I think one that would either that would be a very difficult thing to lay out the entire argument in one video because that's what the whole book will do. And two, some people might be very angry at what I say in my conclusion or in my introduction, but uh, they might be saying, well, you don't have any facts. Uh, well, the facts are now in the body of the book, not in the introduction. So let's just start with the framing. Eventually, we can maybe summarize the whole thing. But uh, to start with, let's start with the actual, uh, just jumping right into the material. I think that would be helpful. So chapter two, section one, uh, if you have the book, if not, I'll put the link along, get the book. Um, uh, we jump into the question of sex and gender, which is clearly a hot button topic. Um, you know, some people would say, well, why, uh, why did these people worried about uh, the transgender issue? Uh, well, because it affects at its heart questions of sex and gender, which affects everyone, because as far as I know, everyone has one uh, or both. So we'll jump into kind of what this means. And I think this can be helpful to some people because we often aren't speaking the same language anymore, <laughs> right? Uh, we can have misunderstandings because we're not speaking about the same thing. So when we're talking about sex, you know, sex and gender, we'll look at them separately. We'll start with sex. What is sex? Um, well, I'll use these two sources I'm using are very um, they're liberal sources. So this isn't something that anyone who's more liberal minded should be objected to. And I don't think there's anything that conservative people would see on here that they would disagree with. So I think although they're both sources are fairly uh, liberal, I think uh, they can be equally agreed upon. So sex is chromosome, chromosomal, uh, right? So this is dealing with the chromosomes, um, XX, XY, or a variety of combinations. Um, it can be gonadal, uh, meaning uh, the testes and ovaries, right? Um, uh, this is 
dealing with the things that produce the hormones in the body. Uh, leading into that, it's also hormonal. Uh, dealing with our hormones and, and how the effects on the body. Uh, the, the internal ancillary reproductive structures, right? So uh, this would be uh, uh, the, the vagina or other internal ones that they, they're part of the sex organs, but they're not producing anything, right? Like, for example, uh, the, the, the testes produce testosterone. The, the penis uh, is an organ, but it's not, uh, uh, it doesn't actually produce uh, anything. It's just uh, 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 a means of reproduction, but it's not, it doesn't produce anything, right? Um, and then there's the external genital morphology, which would be breast or penis, um, uh, other, other uh, external morphology, right? So uh, these are all parts of the five classical approaches that were set up by uh, Dr. Money, uh, who's very controversial, but uh, I think it's acceptable. Um, and then Rachel Ann Williams, who's a transgender activists also added in that they are reproductive, social, and uh, psychological, uh, which I think is also fairly can be agreed upon that there is some level of social and psychological, although that, though that starts to move into gender, right? That could be into the expression of one's sex and gender, but I guess it could be part of sex. And reproductive is, a, an, is kind of the culmination of a lot of the previous ones, right? How do you reproduce? So all of these things deal with sex. So sometimes you might hear that, well, sex is a spectrum, right? You might hear sex is a spectrum. What they're saying is, you know, somebody might have um, one psychological sex, and then they might have ambiguous genital morphology, and then they might have a different um, sets of gonads and a different sets of chromosomes. Well, not really. This isn't really true. <laughs> um, uh, you can't really find examples of this. You can find abnormalities, right? There can be abnormalities, particularly within the, the last five, seven and eight, start moving into gender. So sure, anything socially or anything psychological is possible. But when we're, we're talking about the first six, we're talking about things that are uh, physical. Uh, and it's really n not a spectrum. There are abnormalities, though. Right? We'll, we'll get into that in the next slide. So how do how is sex developed? How how do we get to sex? You know, we kind of we're somewhat illiterate in terms of biology recently. Uh, you know, we just kind of think, well, it's a boy, it's a girl, right? That's it. Well, the, the, there is a process for how this can come about. So at the moment of conception, uh, uh, the one of the chromosomes from the the dad and one of the chromosomes from the mother come together and it starts to the process uh, of, uh, of of human development. So typically if if you receive an XX, you have received an X chromosome from your dad, an X chromosome from your mom, and now you are a female. Uh, if you receive an X chromosome from your mom and a Y chromosome from your dad, you become a boy, right, a male. That's typically how it goes. There are also abnormalities, right? There can be abnormalities. Somebody could be XXX or XXY or X, they say O, meaning they only have one chromosome, sex chromosome. Um, we only have one. So typically it would be XXXY, but there are these abnormalities. These abnormalities are some of the conditions which create intersex. Intersex is an umbrella which we will get into in chapter four, uh, but generally speaking, 99% uh, of people are XXXY and there are some abnormalities which XXX or XXY Generally, if you were to receive XXX, that would be clearly female. There's almost no maleness <laughs> within that, right? There's no Y. And if it's XXY, it could, you know, it, it could create its own sets of challenges, right? So that, those are the challenging ones. And if it's only X, then you only have the f feminine, the female part. There's no Y. So it's more likely the person would turn out to be uh, female, for more, more feminine. And that's based on uh, right, it could be intersex, but it doesn't mean that an in all intersex people are these kind of amorphous in between stages. It can, it just can be 
uh, a sexual abnormality. And as, again, we'll get into in Chapter 4, there are many other ways to be intersex other than just through these chrom chromosomal, chromosomal abnormalities. Now, once a person receives their genetic uh, markers, right there, XXXY, um, it then launches into very quickly, you know, if you ever saw those videos in, uh, in science class during high school or middle school, you know, immediately they start dividing and separating. You're going from one cell to many cells very quickly, right? This moves very quickly uh, and it starts to move uh, into directions, right? The, the genes set off into different directions and it starts forming uh, the, the fetal brain uh, and it starts launching hormones, right? If you're XX, it starts, uh, you, you're, you're getting one set of hormones and if you're XY, you start getting a different set of hormones based on your what your genes are telling them to do. Um, this sets off if you have, all people are really born female, uh, uh, hormonally female, but if, you're, if you have that Y chromosome, it sets off a gene cascade, as they call it, uh, and it starts to differentiate, right? Everyone in some ways are born with uh, ovaries, right? The, the, the organs are somewhat over, more ovary, but if you have that Y gene, the, that gene cascade uh, sets off testosterone, which then starts to create testes out of the, the, the ovaries. And once uh, they now get differentiated, it leads uh, into a different development, which now moves into stage two. Um, between the second and fifth months of gestation, uh, you know, there's a high amount of uh, estrogen and testosterone starting to be released into the body, which is starting to differentiate the way that the bodies are being formed, particularly uh, within the mind uh, within these early months, two to five months. Um, the typical formation, testes produce testosterone uh, and, uh, and it starts to masculinize uh, the external genitalia, the internal duct system, and the brain, right? So, and if you don't have the testosterone, then uh, the hormone, the androgens, the estrogens, uh, they start creating uh, the ovaries, the female uh, body, and the female brain. Um, this is just kind of, as again, kind of a cascade. You can almost think like dominoes, right? The one knocks it off and it just starts a whole series, right? It's, it, you can't say one thing is created by this. This is a series of millions of things, right? Millions of things all taking place at the same time within every cell of the body, right? It, becomes, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it's difficult to stop once you, once you have this, the dominoes going, right? Uh, it, it's described as an intense bath of hormones, right? The body starts swimming in an intense bath of hormones that you're creating at this point, and it starts to affect the neurons within the brain. The neurons start migrating in different ways based on if it's male or female, based on testosterone or estrogen, um, and they're, they're creating brain regions in diff slightly different ways based on male or females. Um, the formation of the hypothalamus especially has a lot to do with, we think, gender expression, um, different glands. Uh, uh, this is all affected by uh, sitting in, you know, in, while you're in your mother's womb, uh, sitting in a pool of estrogen or testosterone that your body is creating. Now moving into the final stage, stage three, uh, the body goes in weeks eight, uh, four to eight. Um, you know, we're not just dealing with time periods, so you know uh, the effects of the body. The body goes through what they call a mini puberty. Right? Uh, it's like, as you know, about regular puberty, puberty when you're a teenager. Um, your body starts flooding uh, with the hormones. Again, in the womb, your body is flooding itself with hormones in weeks four to eight. Um, and you have large bursts of these hormones again in weeks 12 to 14. Um, and it continues all the way up to the first three months. Uh, uh, um, 
of being born. After you're born, your body is still going through this uh, kind of puberty period at the beginning. Um, so we tend to think of things before being born and after being born as being very different. But in this situation, uh, the body is going through this period inside the womb and outside the womb somewhat indistinguishably, right? It, it really doesn't matter whether you're in the womb or outside the womb. It doesn't really matter. The body's going through this uh, period of, of development. Um, and what we have call this neural apoptosis, which is this death of the cells and the creation of brain patterns. We have these, our brains are filled with these neurons and these pathways, and we start using some more than others, and they start developing in certain ways uh, that this creates uh, white fiber, white structures within the brain or gray matter. It starts to uh, create pathways uh, that, are, that exhibit in different ways, which we'll get into. Um, later, but the, but male and females have slightly different pathways, right? They slightly different ways of dealing with things. Other things that are created with these neural pathways uh, in the death of cells creating patterns are things like left-handedness and right-handedness. Um, you know, as things start making sense, right, uh, of itself, it starts organizing itself in a certain way. Now, this last one, it starts getting somewhat into the gender, but these are, from a classical perspective, more interrelated. The, the, these gender aspects come right out of the biological aspects. So the way in which testosterone and estrogen have affected the brains and the death cells and the structures being formed end up creating um, uh, these different ways of approaching the world. So as early as four days old, boys and girls start to making uh, Girls start making twice the eye contact as boys. Uh, by four months old, girls can better differentiate between strangers uh, uh, from people they recognize. Um, boys are able to uh, observe objects moving through space differently, right? So they can more likely catch a ball, right? Not at four months old, but you know, they're more likely to be grabbing at things, catching things. They're able to differentiate between space. Uh, objects in space better than girls, um, and girls develop verbal skills faster than boys, uh, and boys are more likely to be attracted to tools and things to hold on to. So these are just general things that children go through, somewhat because of these, the, the way that the brain is being formed. Uh, now I imagine some of these people will debate. <laughs> uh, we'll get into brain matrices later on where a certain percentage of females have brains that are slightly structured more male and doesn't mean that they are uh, transgender or lesbian it just they have more of a male brain i think it's about 12 percent of the time and then males who have brains that are somewhat structured slightly more female but it again doesn't mean they're transgender or homosexual but it it, it does uh but it occurs a certain percentage of the time, they think, according to these brain matrix, which will make more sense later on. Now, we've really dealt with up to like four months after being born. Uh, this continues, right? This, this begins at conception. It continues all the way into your 20s, right? 20 years old, right? You're still forming in these ways, um, Right. You can look at this Tanner scale developed by a British pediatrician in 1969. Uh, you're looking at uh, the development of the human body outside the womb um, all the way up until 18 years old. Females are on the left and males on the right. Um, they, have they develop at different times, right? But this, this is really describing, for a lot of it, pre-puberty through puberty. Um, with this, you you know, we went through mini puberty, uh, then we go through real puberty, right? Puberty again. So the body again, once you get to your uh, your teenage years, your puberty, you start developing ma large amounts of uh, testosterone or estrogen, which then transforms the body into the adult male, adult female body. Uh, but it also uh, affects the brain, right? Just like it always has, right? So uh, it masculinizes the testosterone, the flood of testosterone masculinizes the brain, the flood of estrogen fe more feminizes the brain. If you think of um, a five-year-old child, 
you know, boys and girls are all somewhat similar, <laughs> right? Uh, I know they are different, but th they are somewhat similar, right? Uh, it's not typically a masculine uh, six-year-old, typically, right? Or a feminine six-year-old. Uh, prepubescence are prepubescence, right? They do have different brain structures and there's different morphologies there, but in general, uh, right, if we were to stay as we were as six-year-olds, you know, we'd still be playing with Barbie dolls and uh, and action figures. Well, some of us still might, I guess, but we would be watching uh, cartoons and doing children things, right? It, it's the test. It's not time that has changed us. It is largely the hormones. Our hormones have masculinized us or feminized us and turned us into men and women, right? Uh, some people might try to slow it down or speed it up socially, but it, the, ultimately the, the hormones kind of push us through that. Um, this, be, this, be, this chart becomes um, uh, pertinent later on because uh, right now SPAC, Dr. SPAC, who brought in um, hormone blockers and transitioning youth, um, transgender youth, uh, has now advocated uh, right now the, for most places the age is 16 uh, for transitioning. Um, he's advocating for uh, at the beginning of Tanner level two, which as you can see here is for females eight years old, as early as eight years old um, transitioning youth uh, and for boys as young as 10 years old. So. Um, you know, as we'll get into later on, the, a bit of a challenge of this, as you can imagine, I kind of just seeing the framing of it, um, to say that an eight-year-old does not feel properly masculinized or feminized would be obvious, <laughs> right? Because it began at conception, but it doesn't finish until 1820, right? And the brain even even longer, right? Uh, mid twenties, uh, the brain is still going, and then once it hits its peak, it starts on it starts its decline. Um, but um, if you were to say an eight year old is not properly masculinized or feminized, the answer is duh, <laughs> right? Uh, because we are at stan Tanner stage one. Uh, there are five stages of uh, development. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, which is all about the masculinization and feminization of the body and the brain as a part of the body. It would be like looking at an eight-year-old girl and saying, well, she needs uh, breast enhancement. Look at that eight-year-old doesn't have breast. Well, no kidding. <laughs> she hasn't had puberty, right? The same way if you looked at a man and you say, oh, that eight-year-old boy he doesn't really have a deep voice and he doesn't have muscle. He, there must be something wrong with him. He's not properly a man. There's nothing wrong with him. He's eight, right? He he has not been properly masculinized yet. Um, now, as a caveat, point out, you know, uh, most of the brain structure is formed um, earlier than the body, right? So, the rest of the body. Um, by four days old, you already have a lot crystallized, meaning it's formed. It's not going to change, right? The brain, those neural pathways that have been formed. They've been formed, they've been formed, and they're not going to unform once they've been formed. Um, so boys are typically boys, and girls are typically girls, even you know before they're four years old. Um, I think there is a, I, I think it's still, part, it's still important to point out though that they are not done, right? They are not done. Especially if somebody, if you were to say, is in between, right? They're not quite sure, right? <laughs> They're in between. I don't really feel like a boy or I don't really feel like a girl. Well, during this, uh, these stages of puberty, well, how could you know how it's going to turn out, <laughs> right? Um, even we, we haven't really studied it at all medically, but if you're saying that a, a boy is not properly masculinized, a, a, a way to masculinize would be through testosterone, right? Uh, instead, we're doing hormone blockers and estrogen, but perhaps the the way to finish masculinizing or feminizing would be sticking with the hormones that your body would naturally be producing uh, in, in, in the, the appropriate levels um, or waiting <laughs> to see how it ends up turning out. Uh, these are all issues which I get into later on in this book. Uh, I'm sure it's making some people upset already, but that's not my intent. 
Um, if we're, again, we're still on sex, primarily on sex, um, well, the classical definition of sex, right, we end up using Webster's Dictionary to define everything. So we say, you know, well, according to Webster, this is this. So therefore, we can just change Webster and it changes the definition of something. Well, in some sense, that is correct. You're right. If, you, if, you're, if your definition is based on the, the dictionary, then yes. Um, but I think Aristotle, you know, is going back to BC, Thomas Aquinas followed it. Uh, it makes some sense. So in his book, The Generation of Animals, he says, and he's talking about human beings here. He talks about every, every type of animal, but uh, th this section he's talking about humans. Males and females are defined differently by having individual faculties, right? different faculties of the person. By definition, a male is an animal that generates in another. So it generates in another is the definition of a male. A female is the animal that generates in itself uh, and then produces offspring who already exists in the generator. Right? Some of that is a little bit old fashioned ideas, but um, incorrect even. Uh, but uh, for the union uh, and birth of offspring, certain parts need to exist. Moreover, they must differ from each other so that consequently the male will differ from the female. In, in the female, this is the uterus, it is the testes and the penis in the male. So this is the kind of classical definition. So if you want to say, well, what is a uh, male? Well, it's one who generates in another, right? Uh, what is a female? One who generates within herself. Um, if you were to then look to the intersex issue, right? Uh, you could say, well, this person has XX chromosomes, but they appear to be male. Uh, you know, do they generate in themselves or do they generate outside of themselves? That would be the question uh, of what determines sex, right? Just sex. Uh, uh, this would be kind of the classical approach. Um, now, the question then is what happens to people who can't reproduce, right? Maybe they're sterile because of uh, being intersex or whatever condition that they have. Well, that becomes more more questionable, right? Then you can start getting into maybe that, that first slide. Start looking at all those different categories, right? Was it seven categories, right? Um, more than that, right? Go into all the different categories of what determines sex and start looking at some of those if, if reproduction isn't. Uh, determinative in itself. Now, some people who are gender theorists, like Rachel Ann Williams, uh, personal gender theorist, uh, she says things like, uh, uh, it is not only possible, it is relatively straightforward to change one's sex. Uh, now, she has gone from male to female. Um, this is a question that I can put out to you now after 28 minutes of this lecture. Is it not only possible but relatively straightforward to change one's sex? Um, one could arguably say no, right? If you start going back to stage one, that goes all the way back to the moment of conception. It's very, un very difficult to undo the moment of conception. Stage two, right? You're looking about weeks or for early months within the womb very difficult to undo puberty, right? As, as even transgender activists might know, it's very difficult to undo puberty. It's very un difficult to undo puberty within the womb as well. Um, and then all of the socialization aspects uh, coming from the brain uh, structures, it would be very difficult to undo it. Um, uh, it would be, right, you would be undoing um, your, can you undo your chromosomes? No. Can you undo your hormones? Well, artificially, you can pause them and take the opposite sex hormones. Can you change the morphology of the body? Well, you can cosmetically change it, but you can't change its functionality, right? You can't create a, a you, you can't produce a penis that produ that will be uh, use that will work. You can't produce a womb that can bear a child. You can't produce breasts that produce milk, right? You can produce the appearances of, but you can't actually change the functionality of it. Socially, you can change, right? But in a biological level, um, I, I don't really think Rachel Ann Williams is correct here to say that it is 
easy just to change one sex, I would think it's actually um, nearly impossible, right, uh, with the current technology. Um, okay, now moving into gender, right? Um, can, uh, you know, what is gender? Gender has uh, different approaches, right? So uh, kind of from a classical perspective, um, using Father Benedict Ashley of happy memory, uh, he was a scientist and a Dominican, a Thomist, um, highly respected. He wrote The Theology of the Body, which is a very big book, very interesting book on the science and, and philosophy and theology all combined. Um, he says, sexual differentiation also leads to varying degrees of dimorphism, meaning there's two different kind, kinds, male and female, right? Dimorphic. Uh, between the sexes, adapting them to a reproductive and, and educative roles as described uh, in the case of human species. This is dimor these species, the, the dimorphism is moderate. So now this is, is an interesting question. Again, you know, if you're looking for a discussion, this is an interesting discussion. How different are males and females from one another socially? You could even say sexually, but right, socially. How different are male and female humans different from one another? Well, compared to other species, some other species, there's a big difference between males and females. If you think about uh, ants, for example, a male ant and female ants are very different from one another. Um, the male ants are basically useless other than reproduction. Uh, they produce no other function within the community, and after they mate, they're driven out <laughs> and killed. Um, females are very different socially um, than males in terms of ants. Uh, the praying mantis, right? The, the size is different, and the male gets eaten, right? Uh, black widows, similar, right? Very different between males and females. Um, you know, you could say, ask about lions, right? They're very different socially. Um, human beings, you know, but what Father Ashley points out, and I think is fairly well ex accepted, is that they are moderate, moderately different, right? They're not greatly different. It's not like men and completely different than women. No, they're most, they're, we're very similar, <laughs> right? As a species, that we're somewhat similar, right? If you think about socially, right, if you go to work and you live your daily life, there's not that much difference between what men can do and what f women can do, right? Uh, fairly similar, but there are some differences, right? Um, now, Benedict Ashley point out, points out uh, the moderate dimorphism is a result of 800 million years of human evolution, uh, and it has probably come from the idea that uh, female fertility is cyclical, right? Every month, females go through a cycle of um, fertility, uh, but their readiness for intercourse is not, meaning their desire to have sexual relations is not cyclical. Uh, it can be consistent throughout the month, which leads the human species to monogamous and relatively permanent bonding, right? So if women's uh, interest was, sexual interest was cyclical, probably would it, we would have evolved differently where men, if theirs was consistent, they would have looked for every fertile female, wherever there was a fertile female, uh, maybe the way dogs do, right? A, a male dog isn't really care, caring about monogamies, uh, He's looking for whatever dog, female dog, is willing, <laughs> right? So uh, that has led dogs not to be monogamous, right? Uh, so this has evolved over time from our biology, the way we've come. Now, the Catechism of the Catholic Church points us out that each sex uh, is an image in, of the power and tenderness of God with equal dignity, though in a different way. So um, the Church's stance is that Men, the two sexes are different, but there are, and they might express themselves slightly differently, but they are equally images of the tenderness and power of God. That there's not one way to be a man and one way to be a woman. There's a very big variety of both, right? Uh, but they, they do note, note that there is a there is a difference the way that women approach the world and difference in the way most men approach the world. Um, so, 
the, going into the next step of gender, there are really three ways in which people look at gender. Um, at least I'll, I'll, I'll put them into three categories. One is, the, again, the classical and more biological approach, the one that had been used for the vast majority of Western history. Uh, and this comes from Sister Mary Prudence, Sister Mercy. Uh, she says that gender, uh, at its very root word, is gen, uh, which means to produce or to beget. Therefore, gender is rooted in images of in reproduction. Uh, we also use gen for generations, to generate, uh, genealogy, genes, genesis, genitals, progeny. As she's pointing out, it's rooted in reproduction, right? Gender is rooted in reproduction. It's very Aristotelian, right? Uh, producing in another or producing within yourself. It's determined sex. This is very much rooted into the history of our understanding of gender, right? Uh, the term. So the radical separation of the concept of the word sex from the concept of the word gender suggested by some 20th century authors is artificial indeed, right? Sure, you can change Webster's Dictionary, but the root of the word, right, the origins of the word, you can't change because they're rooted in history and they meant something that meant progeny, genes, genesis, genital, progeny, right? It's rooted in a biology. That's the biological approach. The next is Dr. Money. Uh, he talked about, he kind of introduced this idea of gender in the 20th century, and, but he did it through this idea of psychological sex. That's how he defined, that's how it was really framed originally, this biological sex of the body, but then there was a psychological sex within the mind. That, that was what they were called gender. Uh, he says, socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that any given society considers appropriate for boys and men uh, and girls and women. So this is a social model of gender, right? So this would be the perspective that gender is socially constructed, right? If society says men wear pants and women wear dresses, then that is contributes to the psychological sex of the person or the gender of the person. Uh, if you go to a different society where women wear pants and men wear uh, dresses, that's perfectly fine too. It's social, right? It's an entirely social perspective of gender. Um, now, Dr. Robert Stoller, who's a good friends, who's good friends with Dr. Money in the previous statement, 1968. That one was 1957, so these are early. 1968. He defines gender identity now. Right? Dr. Money was talking about psychological sex, which he really meant kind of gender, but gender identity as one sense of being a member of a particular sex. Now, this is probably where a lot of modern gender theorists are getting the idea from, right? This idea that to be a member of one gender is just one sense of being a member of a particular sex. So if today I feel as if I am a particular member of the male sex, then that my gender is male. But if tomorrow I feel that my sense of being is uh, more female, I could be, uh, I could be a woman, right? So if if it's this perspective is based entirely on one sense of being, right? So this is very different. So if you're talking about gender, it really matters what framework you're talking about. Are you talking about uh, the kind of a classical approach? This idea that gender is a expression of one sex. Right? like Mary Prudence Allen, sister Mary Prudence Allen, or are you saying, is it just socially constructed, like Dr. Money, or are you, are you like Dr. Stoller and saying, it's a sense of being a member of one sex? Now this changes a lot because activists, people will talk about this a lot. There was a debate between transgender activist Indigo Fox and transgender activist <laughs> Blair White. And Indigo Fox says, um, well, anyone, you know, science has proven that there, that there are 76 genders or 100 infinite amount of genders. Well, this depends on your definition, right? Um, if you're saying that there are 76 genders or science proves that there are 76 genders or an infinite number of genders, well, then you're talking about really number three. 
right? You're looking at Dr. Stoller's approach. And in that regard, yeah, there are an infinite number of genders because it's whatever your sense of being is, right? <laughs> Who, who is anyone to be able to tell anybody else what their sense of gender is, right? Uh, this is entirely subjective, right? Every person could have 100 different forms of their own uh, identity, right? This isn't, there's no limit to one's identity. But this isn't what science is, pro is medically proving, right? <laughs> this, there's, there's no way to medically prove any of that. This is entirely ideology, right? Entirely philosophy, your framework, um, I guess socially as well, right? If you're talking about sometimes other cultures have different ways of being, um, you know, sometimes you talk about two-spirit or other things like this. Well, this you're talking about social now, right? This is social, right? That we have a role for people within a society, the kinners of India, or the lady boys of Thailand, right? These are social roles. Science can really only prove this first one because the first one is talking about sex, which can be proven, right? Because it's criteria of what determines sex, objective criteria that you can measure. Therefore, you can talk about science in number one, <laughs> but you can't really talk about medical science in stages two and three. These are social, right? Social and individual, um, which we get into later on in subsection um, 4, 2.4. Um, so the, I don't know how clear this picture is, you know, it's kind of faded in this image, but this kind of modern gender framework has this idea that sex is one silo and gender is another silo, and they're really not necessarily related to one another. One can be one sex and a different gender, and it just happens to be that way, right? They're siloed issues. Um, the traditional framework is that sex and gender are interrelated. And I think Blair White uh, described it well in that debate. She says there are only two genders. She's again talking about perspective number one, the, bi the biological one. Um, separating gender from sex is like separating waves from the ocean, right? You can't separate the two, right? This is clearly a, a number one perspective, a, a, a Sister Mary Prudence Allen's perspective, right? Like the yin and the yang, right? You, you can't, they, they are interrelated in a way that can't be undone. And I get into this later on um, with Thomism because the Thomism and Aristotelianism, um, everything is interrelated, right? They, they are interrelated they're not siloed. The modern approach is very siloed approach. Um, but gender, orientation, expression, uh, sex, it, from a Thomistic perspective, is interrelated. These perspectives, the modern perspective, everything's a silo. Uh, again, we'll get into that later on. Another one of these issues that's popular now is this separation of this idea of essence from properties. Um, kind of put this slide upside down just to leave room for me to fit in the corner here. <laughs> if I put, switched it around, it wouldn't have worked. Um, so if you were to say the essence of something, the form of something, right, something's being um, is what you, something is. But then certain properties are not necessary, but they follow the essence. So for example, all apples are apples, right? The essence of apple um, uh, has to be within an apple, right? Uh, you can't have uh, some apples that are oranges. You can't have some apples that are um, mangoes, right? It, this just doesn't work because the essence of what makes something an apple is its appleness, right? It, it is what it, what it is, right? That's its essence. Now, uh, things can also then have properties which are not essential, right? So some apples, well, apples are fruit because uh, the property uh, of the apple is a fruit. Um, so uh, not all fruit are apples, right? Not all fruit uh, is an apple, uh, but all apples are fruit. Right? because the property of the apple is a fruit. Um, 
Likewise, from this argument uh, of essence and properties, uh, not, you know, the question, are all women mothers? No, not all women are mothers. So motherhood is not an essential attribute. It's not essential because some women are not mothers. But is motherhood, are all mothers women? Well, this would be a property of women. So women, when they reproduce, the property would be motherhood, right? Uh, when a father reproduces, the property would be fatherhood. Now, you know, this is even being debated now. So uh, journalist Amy Nichols appeared on Good Morning Britain to argue saying that anyone can be, anyone, including men, can be mothers. Uh, she, I believe, was a single mother, and so she was arguing that she was both a father and a mother to her child because um, uh, motherhood and fatherhood are not sex specific. Now, uh, Archbishop Carlson uh, from St. Louis, he points out that uh, masculinity, masculinity and femininity uh, are very diverse and there's plenty of room for that, right? The, the only way to be a male is not to be uh, G.I. Joe and the only way to be a female is not to be a Barbie doll. There's a wide variety of ways, of ways to be a female. There's a wide variety of ways to be a male. Um, these are called gender stereotypes. And what Archbishop Carlson was pointing out is we don't let stereotypes determine one's, uh, one's gender, right? It's not based on the stereotypes of what it means to be a male or a female. Um, it's a result of the biology, therefore it's, it, these are properties, <laughs> right? So if you are a father who likes to, if you are a man who has a child, therefore your father and you like to cook and you like to garden and you like to, and you stay home and take care of the children and the wife goes away to work uh, you don't become a mother <laughs> right you are your father right uh, but you could be sensitive and you could be a good listener and you could be then you're a good father right well you could be a woman but you could be a go-getter and good at business and you could you know you don't want to stay home with the kids the father will stay home with the kids Okay, you're still the mother, and that's fine, <laughs> right? There's nothing wrong with a woman who goes to work and the man stays home, right? These are stereotypes. These are just stereotypes. As Archbishop Carlson, Carlson's pointing out that this is often becoming a, a point of confusion for people, especially for teenagers who are looking for a sense of identity. You know, they're trying to figure out who they are, and especially at 13, 12, 14 years old, they don't know who they are. If they're saying, well, I don't feel like my mother. Well, that's fine. <laughs> I don't feel like the stereotypes of women. That's fine. That's not the type of woman you are. But because you are a, you are a female, therefore you will become a woman. So whatever type of woman you are, you know, you're a woman who likes to wear pants and climb trees and go to work and hunt. That's fine. That's the type of woman you are. It doesn't make you a man because your actions don't create, uh, uh, your social actions don't create uh, that, that aspect. The, the thing that creates that aspect is the action of reproduction. That's the only thing that it, that it is and it's the only thing that it determines, right? Uh, the rest of it is largely social and psychological. Uh, and we're putting a lot of expectations on what that is supposed to mean, um, right? Uh, again, if a mother, uh, takes her son out to hunt and teaches her son to hunt, she's not being a father. She's being a mother who teaches her son to hunt, <laughs> right? Uh, if a mother goes fishing with her child, she's not doing man activities. She's doing motherly activities with her son. That might be stereotypically male, but because of her relationship with her child as mother, her actions all become motherhood. Uh, to do the, to go beyond this is just to to start. It gets more complicated, which we get into. Now this is again questions. You know, if you're going to use this for a discussion or trying to figure out where you stand on these topics, these are the questions that now result from this philosophy. These philosophies. So for coming from the very um, the gender theorist perspective, people like. Erickson Schroth and Jacobs, 
Um, if you want to know all the real sources of this, get the book or send me a message and I'll answer. Uh, type in the authors and the date, you can probably find the book uh, online. Um, they gave an, an example of a person who was born a female, became a male, uh, and then gave birth, you know, intentionally got pregnant and gave birth. And the person responded, pregnancy and childbirth were very male experiences for me. When I birthed my child, I was born into fatherhood. Right? This is that topic of the birth, birthing people right now. Right? Be a, a male who gives birth because they're transgender from female to male. Right? Birthing people. Um, well, that's an interesting perspective, but it's redefining what it means to be a male or female, right? It's not the classical approach to male or female because all it means to be a male is to generate in another, according to Aristotle, and all it means to be a female is one that generates within oneself. So that if that's the definition, right, if that's as far as it's not predictive of anything else, if that's the definition, then to reproduce uh, within yourself is by definition a female, right? It's definition of womanhood because that is actually all that it means, right? Uh, if you could say, again, not, not to, to kill a dead horse, you know, kick a dead horse, but, you know, it's not the makeup. It's not the, um, it's not the, the social role. It's not what you like to do on your weekend. It's not how you see yourself. The only thing that determines male or femaleness in a classical perspective is can you reproduce in yourself or outside of yourself? That, <laughs> that's it. So to... To redefine that, to redefine that is just it's contrary to the classical approach. So anyone who is watching this who is part of more be more of the gender theorist approach, and you think, well, everyone who disagrees with this, my perspective is a transphobe. Well, consider within the last two decades, you're rewriting the whole definition of what sex is. <laughs> right? You are throwing out all of the history of sex. Uh, within the last 20 years, and not everyone will philosophically agree with your philosophical perspective, right? Uh, it's okay for you to have your philosophical perspective, but other people will have different philosophical perspectives than you, and they should be allowed to be expressed within the marketplace of ideas, right? If you have a truly convincing argument, eventually your ideology will win. <laughs> and uh, if not, it won't, right? It won't persist. Um, doesn't mean somebody hates you. Doesn't mean someone's trying to erase you. This, everything I've spoken about within the last 52 minutes is dealing with philosophical perspectives on sex and gender. Um, and they can be debated in a free society, which they are. Um, and I think it's just helpful for people to have some of the framing so that you can you kind of know what each side is talking about, and now you can kind of come up with your own uh, conclusions of what you think this might mean, right? Or keep watching, and maybe you'll get more. Um, so next time, I'm moving into gender dysphoria, and I will probably also mix into it uh, sex reassignment surgery, mostly linking them together because they're not highly philosophical principles, right? These are medical, medical diagnoses in the DSM. Um, and it is a medical procedure, so going through all of the cuts and incisions isn't particularly interesting. So it'll be a summary of the next two. Once we get into 2.4, we get into gender ideologies, which again would bring up some of these topics, but they will be far more interesting and will be a long video, but uh, is an interesting one, and I think it's very helpful. 2.4, 2.3, 2.2 kind of just to get everyone on the same page with vocabulary and ideas. Good for, uh, you know, a resource if you needed to write a term paper and include that. Okay, so that's all I have for this time. I hope you found this useful. I know it's very long, but the book is very long. <laughs> okay, have a great rest of your day.